Good afternoon. Uh, let's get this uh, session started. Uh, my name is Erik Huizer. I'm, uh, I have the honor of chairing this session. And this session is not going to be in the form of presentations, but is going to be in the form of a panel discussion. And uh, the subject for this panel is uh, facing the challenges uh, for the uh, European NREN uh, landscape. Um, there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, I think uh, the, the opening uh, plenary speaker, Barend Moms, uh, already pointed out uh, some huge challenges that lay ahead of us. And there's other challenges on top of that. Um, and we are going to try and discuss these uh, in this session and well, how we can organize um, the European NRENs uh, together with the other NRENs in the world um, to see how we can best face these challenges. And um, with me, I have a, a, a very good panel, I think. Um, let me briefly introduce you uh, to the panel. Uh, on my uh, left side, your right side, is Andreas Dutler. He is CEO of SWITCH, the Swiss Academic and Research Network. Uh, right to my left, your uh, right, is uh, Dave Lambert, CEO of Internet2, the uh, US uh, Educational Research Network. Uh, to my right is uh, Erwin Bloemink, CEO of SurfNet, the Dutch Academic and Research Network. And to my far right is Zoran Jovanovic, the CEO of AMRES, the Serbian uh, Educational and Research Network. So we have a nice spread of, um, of um, expertise here and, uh, and geographical spread, um, uh, which I hope will make for an interesting discussion. I will kick off with some questions that I have, but uh, I would uh, certainly encourage the audience that if you have uh, questions come up in your mind. Don't hesitate to uh, uh, put your arm up. And uh, if all's well, we have two uh, microphones available for questions from the uh, from the audience, and we uh, we'll take them uh, uh, as we seem fit. So let's start off. Um, one of the um, things that happened over the last couple of years is that a new rather informal organization came into being called the CEO Forum. And uh, my first question uh, would be, what is that CEO Forum? And, and, and what, what is it from your perspective? What does it do and, and what, what kind of role does it have? And um, uh, uh, let me start with one of the people who took the initiative for this. So, Dave, oh. uh, you have a first go at that. <laughs> Heck, I was hoping you'd say earlier. Uh, uh, no, no, let me give you a, a little bit of background. Uh, and, and, and actually, if there, if there is probably anybody to, to blame for sparking this idea within our community, uh, Professor Jinping Wu from, from uh, CERNET, when I, when I first assumed the role uh, of CEO of Internet2, um, uh, pointed out to me in, a, in, a, in an interesting conversation that uh, while, while there, were, there were a number of vehicles that we had across the interim community for collaboration, that there was, noth there was no venue that enabled uh, the folks who were, who were essentially leading you know, major national INRINs to be able to, 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 to work together. And I think over the next year or so, uh, as I had dyadic conversations with my colleagues, it became obvious that at least a subset at that point in time of the research and education networks were looking up into a fast approaching train that was just about to wipe us out. And it was not driven so much at that point by, you know, what I would characterize as the traditional roles of NRANs. And I talked some about this, I think, at last year's Terrain meeting, but uh, the 
what th th this emerging set of expectations that were being placed on NRENs to provide service above the net, to run identity federations, to provide gateways to content, to do, uh, you know, to be a foundation for expanding global education movements and a whole variety of new challenges that I think quite honestly, none of us felt that we were particularly well positioned to uh, develop strategies to address those new challenges uh, and, and uh, we really exist sort of in a situation where it's not like we, we, we can in our own countries pick up the phone and talk to, to someone and say, how do we solve this problem? We had to solve that across the global boundaries. And so we began a conversation that resulted in the Global Interim CEO Forum that was, that was brought into place, you know, after a lot of conversations. Um, we knew that, uh, you know, the, 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 we wanted to create a vehicle that was primarily, I guess I would say, a trust community for a few of us who talked a lot about solving a set of problems to spend more time together to do that. And that's really above all else, you know, sort of what we set out to do. As we began to, to go through the process of deciding how to do that, you know, we addressed a whole series of issues. You know, what should this be? And I think there were four or five, three or four principles that we, that we settled on. Uh, number one, it should not be formal. It should not be uh, seen as governance. It should not be seen as anything that, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is any sort of elected or representative body of the NREN community in any way, shape, or form. That would be, have been an impossible task. Number two, that uh, it, because our mutual interests were focused on you know, trying to figure out how to address some really large-scale challenges and opportunities that were addressing us, that it was important for us to keep the group sort of small and, and focused around a set of people that we thought had the resources uh, to be able to uh, contribute staff to some of the projects we wanted to do and quite frankly be able to write big checks uh, when the time came to you know build projects that would have some staff to have substantial critical mass I think then factored in with a dollop of uh, of uh, sort of who, who is it in the community that uh, you know, we feel has kind of a shared vision of where we need to go when facing similar challenges. Uh, and we looked at several models for how we pulled this together. The one that we sort of decided on was, you know, we sort of looked at the United Nations model and, you know, no way is that doable. We looked at sort of G4, G8 models of, you know, that they use in the diplomatic space and that was clearly too exclusive and settled ourselves in around a model that was kind of like the G20, uh, you know, the, the, the global forum uh, whereby uh, e uh, finance ministers come together on a, on a recurring basis to address large-scale issues, uh, and uh, there's no specific governance, nobody is the, is the president of the, of the G20. Uh, it, it rotates around the world. Uh, you know, the people who are responsible for organizing the meetings rotate around the world. And uh, so as we went through that process, we extended um, 15 invitations to uh, executive leadership of, of national research and education networks to participate, including um, uh, three of the uh, four of what we would call multi-state entities that were network, you know, that were operators that were in the same situation that the research and education networks were. And we began this process uh, three meetings ago. I'd, I'd have to stretch now to remember how long that was. I think of it in, in, in terms of meetings. And, and in the process of doing that, discovered very early on that as we sat down and said, okay, what are the challenges we're facing for the next, for the next foreseeable, for the foreseeable future? that we were all facing the same challenges. And the next conversation turned to, are there any of these where we would be well served to consider uh, acting uh, in, a, in an interdependent manner instead of in an independent or even collaborative manner? And uh, so uh, in our first 
meeting, uh, we chose four primary areas that we wanted to create working groups, uh, what we called global network architecture, and, and you'll hear a lot about that here at this meeting. There's a particular presentation on that effort. Um, on uh, collaboration technologies, how do we, how do we, how do we get the uh, video, sort of video conferencing, SIP-based services that we're all offering to actually work smoothly and effectively across the global community and how do we create something that will allow us to offer that as a service to virtual research organizations, to universities uh, with you know, our university members who are working globally. Um, uh, the third one was, was trying to bring the executive level critical mass to the issue getting over the final hump on interfederation and choosing a, a, an approach to interfederation that we're all committed to support and then lining up to, to move that process forward. And the fourth one was, uh, I think in a way more exploratory, and that was we were all at one level or another, or most of us at one level or another, of beginning to develop relationships for providing services above the network. And as we looked out in the world, uh, it became very obvious that that was not a strategy that should be being pursued on a national level because the primary consumers of those services, uh, our virtual research organizations, our universities, are now in fact global. And to have one package of, 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 net, of above the net services in the US and another package in, uh, in Europe and another package in Asia would in effect create the sort of dead ends in collaboration that we didn't want to have. Uh, uh, we, have, we have met three times. We'll meet a fourth time in uh, July in Los Angeles. Um, we have since added four additional, uh, are in the process of adding four additional working groups to, those, uh, to that process. What we hope to do, honestly, is to not make the forum a permanent governance vehicle for any of these projects. Uh, you know, what we want to do with the energies of the uh, CEO leaders who participate is to see if we, can, if we can provide just that extra little bit of resources and uh, political energy to pushing these global collaborative projects across the line. Uh, with the, with the, not only the hope, but the expectation around a project like Global Network Architecture, for instance, GNA, that it will unfold as a broad community effort over time. Right. And, built and upon the initial presumption of um, starting small, uh, getting some white papers out there, and then gradually beginning to broaden the base of participation. Because that's the question that yeah. comes to mind. How, how do you involve, because you know as well as I do that this will only work if you get all entrants right. in the end mm -hmm. to, to, to contribute and to work with that. So, so how do you envision this to go from the G20 and to reach out to all the entrants? Well, I think our perspective on that at the moment is that sort of we do that a project at a time because uh, we have one set of institutions that are really prepared to contribute to and uh, you know the development of the global network architecture, for instance. You know, if you look at who writes the checks for the global infrastructure that it exists now, it's not a lot of it's not a lot of inrents, uh, and it needs to be more. And there needs to be massively more expenditure made. But if you're going to start on that problem, where do you start? You start with the investors, right? You start with the people who are able to to write the checks that make the thing uh, happen more effectively, and then you work out from that. And I think as you, as you watch the, as, you know, if, if you watch the, the extension of the Global Network Architecture Project, which is, which is really under Eric Yon's uh, leadership, that he's trying to craft a very uh, careful path toward balancing, um, you know, clarity in a small enough group to push the project over barriers. A and as, uh, he hits particular milestones to begin broaden the base of participation to those who, who want to bring resources to the table and who want to play in okay. the success of these projects. Well, let's check that. Andreas, what, do you, what have you noted about the CEO forum and, and how do you look at it? Yeah, my problem as a responsible of a small end when is, uh, if, if it is a problem, I really do not know nearly nothing about the CEO forum. I heard now you compare yourself with the G20. That assumes, uh, gives me the idea that you are about 20 of 
of, uh, but if you had asked me five minutes ago, I would have said uh, you're about five or six. So I think the, my problem is I do not know what you are doing. I do not know what you are thinking. I cannot, uh, I have no idea whether that concerns me or not. And probably you know that we have uh, our own struggles in Europe with uh, restructuring and uh, having different bodies today making their independent strategies. We have to solve that. And now it's, it's hard to me to, to see what is the effect of the CEO Global Forum for me or for Switch as a, as a small and then perhaps for many small entrants in, uh, in Europe. Soren, uh, how, how do you look at that? Similar <laughs> to the Swiss case, and there is an enormous difference in the amount of money that their network has and our network has, and probably will be among those entrants that will be the last that will join such a type of club. So really, I also didn't hear a lot about the whole initiative before coming here. And surely my country will never be among the G20. <laughs> so Erwin, uh, Surfnet is involved, and, and, and what is your perspective, and how do you think we, we will involve the other entrants? Well, as Dave explained, is it, it is currently an informal forum, and what it aims at is to, to accelerate the development. If you, if you look at how we interact in our, in our environment, it, we are a very global community, but what we didn't achieve is to make it global at, at the, the management level, at the, at the top management level of the different NRANs. And what we try to achieve is to share the challenges we face as, as a national entity uh, with each other, and try to set the agenda, or try to define an agenda that that strikes that, what, that, that is resemblant of each other, and uh, look at what we are doing currently internationally, which is a lot, and try to pick if if we focus our attention for a couple of months or a year on this topic, for instance, uh, identity management, which which was very, taking off very well in in Europe but was stagnating in some other parts. And if we can convince or, or put effort in discussing that and, and convince each other whether Edugain is a good way forward or not for, for the, for the uh, whole global environment or not. And uh, if we, uh, well, we, we ended that discussion uh, successfully. Uh, so uh, all of the, 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 the NRANs participating in the, uh, the the forum uh, now are in the process of connecting to, to Adrian, which is a major step forward uh, in, in putting that in place. Um, so th that is what, uh, what is important, to, to create critical mass and to accelerate some of the developments. I don't see the CEO forum as a forum that, that initiates or that uh, invents things. It is looking for opportunities that are available in our community putting our effort behind it to, to take it to the next step and let it loose, because that is also important. We, as we currently are, are not a, a, an organization that can take up formal governance role or wants to take up <coughs> formal governance roles. It is about acceleration. Okay. Okay. Uh, but may I ask, Andreas, uh, Erwin, yes. what are the priorities of the next year of the CEO Global? Sorry, of the what are the priorities of you for the work of the next year? I think one of the priorities is, is the initiative that Dave also already referred to, that is the global network architecture. Um, if we look, for instance, between the US and Europe, we uh, combined have 30, 30 uh, 10 gigabit links between those two uh, continents. And we, well, there are several uh, organizations that pay for these links. And what we try to uh, uh, achieve is a new model of operating this. Mm -hmm. And so last year we announced the, uh, the, the first 100 gig uh, intercontinental link, which is a techno technology, uh, technology showcase, but also a showcase of what we can achieve by combining our buying power, because there were well, five, six uh, 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 NRANs involved, um, collectively buying a service which, with a larger quantity 
And if you go into that direction, which is what's still a test link and not a production link, because we only have one, um, and you start thinking about, well, how does this structure needs to be to be able to, um, to have a real production service and be more efficient with each other and deliver more value to our uh, researchers and, and educators? Because that is what it's about. That is what also uh, uh, someone like Boris Mons is talking about. The, the data that is, is growing, we need to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect our budgets to increase the next few years. Well, so we need to five, find new 5%, ways. Five percent, he said. We we need, we need to get five percent of uh, of the horizon 2020. Yes, for data stewardship. <laughs> but uh, I think he thinks about zero dots, yeah. something for networking. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, uh, but is, isn't this? Um, aren't aren't we? Uh, shouldn't we wor be working to a governance model, worldwide governance model, somehow? where we try and attack these problems in an open, multi-stakeholder environment. I mean, I look at the internet, and you know, the internet is much larger as the NRENs combined, and there we have the same problem. There's no central authority, and we have to, f uh, to solve lots of problems there, and what we do is we created an IETF, we created an IGF, and we created, created an ICANN, and we went for a, a, a multi-stakeholder model, which is different in each of the cases, but the, the multi-stakeholderism is there, it's open, it's, it's accessible. Uh, shouldn't we, we try and, and create something like that for, for the NRANs too, uh, where, where the, the advanced NRANs can, can go off and experiment and then bring back the results into this forum and then work with that uh, so that everybody uh, uh, gets that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we should try and innovate with, uh, yeah. with like 300 parties. I think parties. you described what we're trying to do relatively well. Okay. I, I, I mean, our, our, you know, my, my own personal perspective on multi-stakeholder processes, okay, is that there has to be a there there before multi-stakeholder processes really take hold. And, uh, you know, when, when you look at, you know, the history, for instance, on federation, Okay, there's been an enormous amount of work done for 15 years. So, I, I mean, somebody's in the room could correct me here. I would say at least 15 years, uh, perhaps in excess of that, uh, focusing on on the fundamental technologies that we already have in place that I think will enable interfederation. Uh, but you know, we've never gotten to the point where we, you know, outside of Edgerome, where we have really working example of flexible interfederation that we can begin to build broader based uh, 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 multi-stakeholder processes around. And so, you know, if you look at something like uh, 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 one of our projects like the GNA, uh, uh, there are some suggestions in the white paper that, that a number of community people worked on about how we move toward the multi-stakeholder pro process that we necessary for governance. In the, you know, in the, in the interfederation working group, uh, you know, there was a strong recommendation that we transition the edugain, the European-based edugain uh, governance model into a global model. And so what we're trying to do is, I think, probably accelerate, you know, get the level of acceleration for some of these projects that create the critical mass that move the projects to the point where multi-stakeholder processes can really be organized and brought into place. Okay. Soren, if we would, if we would work to a such a process, do you think you from Serbia would participate in that or are you more focused on, on your national problems or is this, is this also uh, things, uh, are these things like inter, inter, international federation, are those things that, you, that, that you're interested in too? Of course that we would participate in, in that, those international efforts. We have a very good EduRome network in our country, so we are already participating and EduRome is really an example, an exceptional example of how the whole thing could work. And I think it's a pity that uh, the results from that uh, project are not today as a commercial thing covering cities where people are using EduRome technology and roaming between wireless hotspots. It, it's a thing that could be sold as a major contribution to the development of wireless 
networks in the world. Andreas, um, um, what you take? Would you? Would you? Uh, what would you say if we we got to such an open environment? Uh, do you see that as a necessity, or do you say, uh, well, we have enough of our problems around uh, uh, Switzerland and Europe? No, I see it as a as a good uh, possibility, but the priorities of each NRENs are the own users in their respective own countries. So the first purpose of SWITCH is to solve Switzerland's uh, research and education. And if that is similar, like the Dutch yeah. needs or the Serbian needs, whatever, then we can collaborate, and we will collaborate. Unfortunately, our users also work internationally. They have to collaborate, so that's a good starting point. But we should never forget our first purpose, that's solve our local users. And if we have same priorities, we can go in that direction. And I'm convinced that not all the 30 NRANs in Europe always have the same first priorities. So we should uh, work with clusters in Europe, we should work in clusters worldwide, so that model was fit, fits well. I'm wondering, coming back to the CEO forum, how the outcome then is uh, distributed to all the NRANs. Mm -hmm. and that's a point where I have my, my question marks. Yeah. No, you, you raised that issue earlier, and, and uh, you know, early on in the forum, um, you know, we decided that, that at, the, you know, at the end of each meeting, we would generate a, a, a broad communique, which the forum members you know, had, had uh, you know, carried the responsibility to make sure that it was distributed to their key stakeholders, mm -hmm. so they would have an opportunity to uh, you know, interact. Uh, if they weren't involved in the forum, they, they, you know, they had the, inter the, the opportunity to interact. And, um, and, 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 you know, and, and, but, but, you know, as we, as we turn the process now toward what, what Erwin calls, I, I love the word, accelerate these efforts, uh, and you look at something like, like global, uh, global network architecture, um, we are, we are now in the process where, uh, Eric Jan is leading the community through a much more active broadening process there. We're learning a lot as we go. Uh, we're doing, you know, we, 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 you know, we got a, uh, you know, using the small group, we got a white paper written that we think captured a lot of energy that was out there in the community. That white paper is now out there for review. Uh, we've done uh, updates on the GNA project at the, at the Internet2 Global Summit. We've got one scheduled uh, here at Terena. We've got one scheduled at APAN. We've got one scheduled at the African uh, meeting. Uh, I'm not sure whether there's one scheduled at TCAL, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but but uh, there should be, mm -hmm. and so you know our goal, uh, you know, is to is to is to be uh, broadly engaging, communicative, but but doing that, focusing that primarily on the individual projects because the level of interest in the individual projects varies a lot. You know, you can't even even in our one of the reasons why we chose these as 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 a, as a small subset is because we all had a mutual interest in them. In them, that doesn't mean that everybody else has a mutual interest in. I would, I would just say one other thing relative to the point you make, which I, I think is a good point. I think we all understand that that we all of our uh, loyalties lie with our university members and our countries. But, 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 but I do think what has unfolded in the set of relationships that we've built here is an increasing willingness, if we see the global value, to subrogate a national interest or to try to bring an element of our national community forward to or a global solution. Uh, a good example of that is, you know, the U.S., you know, the, the, the agreement, uh, you know, the, the approval uh, a few weeks ago at the summit of, uh, of the U.S. becoming part of the Edge Gain uh, Consortium. And, and that wasn't an easy task because uh, there's not perfect alignment in the two approaches and clearly there's gonna to need to be some, some uh, uh, expansion uh, of the Edugain model and changing in priorities to meet the US's needs. But I think at this point in time, across the community, we have enough trust mm -hmm. in the leadership of others that we're prepared to say, let's go do that. And so I think at a level 
within the mem- these members, we've moved slightly past the, the precipice of what I would call collaboration to a sort of a next plateau of what I would begin to call intentional interdependence, where we are making decisions to uh, depend on group choices and then work hard to make those group choices uh, the best choice for ourselves within our country because at the global level, we gain, we gain a much better ability to offer global services. Right. So, Aaron, how would this influence the European way of working? We work together in, uh, uh, for example, in Géant. We, we work closely together. How, how do you see that influence um, our, our working together in Géant? Well, I don't know how that would influence the work. I, I think there, there will be two new types of opportunities. That is that what is being done in Xi'an, uh, that it will be more normal for, for at least for the, 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 the people participating in the forum uh, to have a global perspective because that is the central uh, acceleration and global are the two cent- key concepts, I think, of the, of the, of the forum. Um, have, a, have a global uh, point of view and, uh, and step beyond, and I think that is what, what Dave is also referring to, inter- interdependence, uh, being interdependent. Uh, um, uh, step beyond not the, the, the not invented here syndrome because that we all have um, uh, and, and go beyond that. And w- what I think is important that we have a, a forum that that, uh, that also brings ideas from the, the rest of the world to, towards, the, uh, uh, towards Europe. And one of the interesting things that happened in, in, in uh, Ca- Cape Town uh, uh, last year is that we recognized as, as CEOs of, of these big countries uh, that had money to spend, have money to spend on these subjects, that the people from Africa are, are very innovative in, in the way they handle all these concepts. So we can learn from each other. And that is also an important uh, part of, of the forum that we try to learn from each other's continents, the, the solutions that are being invented and that we might apply in other, um, in other regions in the world. So, um, uh, I've mentioned Cheon, we've mentioned the CEO forum, there's also uh, the, uh, the uh, Glyph. Mm-hmm. Um, um, how, does, um, how does CEO forum relate to Glyph, or does it relate at all to Glyph, or should it relate to Glyph? Uh, I, 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 you know, we, we, we have had a, an ongoing process of communication with the Glyph. The, the primary intersection point right now for the Glyph and the work that we're doing in the forum is through the GNA initiative. And uh, you know it is the global network th- what we call the global network <laughs> architecture initiative that that really goes to the heart of where of of where uh, we have these big overlapping mutual interests because because the glyph community is where the architects are, <laughs> and 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 it's the architects. Uh, uh, those people who've been who've been building and engineering global circuits and, and open exchange points for for years uh, that need to come together for a whole variety of reasons. One of which is is just simply to to buy into the notion that we can get beyond the current uh, uh, very limited architecture of 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 the global research and education networks, which I liken to sort of where we were in universities 20 years ago when the biology department connected to the math department and the physics department connected to the, you know, to, to the research lab and, and you, 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 nobody, there was nobody tending the store in terms of overall strategy and the money was coming from a lot of different places. That, that's basically with, you know, we've done a lot of good work there. We've done a lot of great pioneering work. It's hard to do, but that's basically where we are. And, uh, you know, as, as a leader of a national research and education network, you would not run or architect your network like the global network is run and architected. You would need a more coherent architecture, and that's what we're trying to foster here. And so the partnership with the, with, with the uh, 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 here 
is, is with the glyph community is very very important to us because that's where that you know that's where the actors come from and so we Eric Yon has tried to to progressively bring more people into that now let me also say that I don't think the GNA and the glyph are the same thing nor do we even want to think about them as the same thing the GNA has a has a, a you know what what we want to try to achieve with global network architecture is really around building a flexible global infrastructure that we're able to use for everything from you know layer one, layer two, layer three services to extend them to use for uh, experimental networks and production networks. Um, it, it, it is an effort at infrastructure building. The glyph is very much different than that when it's doing what it should be. The glyph is the place where we bring together the researchers and the engineers and the architects that are going to focus on identifying what those next technologies are out there, are going to identify uh, you know, how we're going to incorporate advanced technologies like name data networking into our global infrastructure and be able to support multiple kinds of applications and to explore those things. So uh, this is an instance we think where there's a collaborative activity uh, building the design for GNA, and that's what we're going to work on. But uh, GNA has no interest in, in taking on the much broader set of functions that uh, the Glyph has provided for the global networking community for a long time. But I on hope the other well end, into the, the future. G the GNA will also look into uh, fun, uh, 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 cost sharing issues and stuff like you that. You know, the, G the GNA also, now the big challenge for the GNA, we have two working groups in, in GNA. We've got the architecture, we, we've got the technical folks trying to figure out what the architecture should be, be looking at, what it costs, and then what we have, you know, what we sort of call a little political or executive action team that is now trying to figure out, uh, you know, how we go about increasing the amount of global investment in the infrastructure and, and pulling the various funding agencies and funding entities into this and building new partnerships. So we've got a group there that's focusing on engaging with the government funders. We've got, you know, we're, we're looking at how we engage with the global large scale research projects like SKA, IDER, LHC and how we bring those resources into support for the global architecture. We're looking at how we build uh, co coherent relationships with the private sector actors that are going to provide the technologies that we ultimately need, like the like the global fiber providers okay. and the global, uh, uh, in particular, the global fiber providers and the global uh, uh, optical providers. So we're going to be a very very important part of this equation. Okay, thank you. I, wa I want to switch over to the European, focus a little bit more on Europe. Uh, and in Europe, we are, um, uh, a, a couple of years ago, there was a report published uh, from the Géant uh, Expert Group. And uh, that was uh, uh, quite a good report that created a lot of, uh, of impact, I think, uh, for this community. And, and one of the recommendations in that report was that the European NRANs should look at reorganizing themselves in a more structured way. Um, and uh, as a result of that, um, there has been work going on in the, in, in the, uh, over the last year uh, in trying uh, to build, uh, 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 to work towards a new organization. Um, uh, Aaron, you've been involved in, in that. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what the direction is that that is going? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, well, the, when the Geon Expert Group uh, report was uh, published, uh, shortly after that, there was a group installed two years ago at Terina in Reykjavik, uh, and it was called the Reykjavik Group, and Andreas was, uh, was heading that, uh, that group. Uh, who looked at the report and, and clearly stated that the report said the right things about the organization, that we should be um, more clear about the three functions we have at the European level, strategy setting and coordination and community at one hand, uh, the operations of, of services, that's the second one, and the third one being innovation, and that we sh should clearly separate these and bring these together. And um, it, 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 we, we published that report. I was also on the Reykjavik group. Uh, we published that report well, a year and a half ago, I think, uh, um, and, and asked the, the two boards of, of Dante and Turina to come up with a plan. And we hoped as a Reykjavik group that they come up, came up with a plan for the, the last uh, TNC in, in Maastricht. But nothing had really happened until then. But, uh, the good thing was that there was a good discussion in, 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 in Maastricht about 
uh, what should happen next. Mm -hmm. And we met well, um, one month later, I think, in, in Brussels. And of course, then there, <laughs> then there will be a new group, which, which is called the Brussels Group, to bring this forward. And, and some things had <laughs> has happened uh, in between. Some of the members of the Reykjavik group, including myself, but also Christian Grimm and Patrick Donat, uh, had been appointed on the boards of Dante and Torina, so there was a lot of um, um, uh, enthusiasm for, for bringing this forward. And we kind of uh, pushed this forward and, and installed the Brussels Group, which, which are four people who are charged to, to bring this process forward. And we have made some steps, and there's now consensus hopefully on the first day <laughs> on, <laughs> on uh, the steps forward on bringing these two organizations more uh, uh, together. And, and I think um, as, as a relatively uh, relative outsider, I joined this international community only two years ago, it was quite, well, strange to, to, to uh, tr well, it, it was difficult to understand how things run in this community. Because there seems to be three, st at least three strategy setting bodies. Uh, uh, the General Assembly of Torina, uh, the, the uh, shareholders of, uh, of Dante, and something called the NREN PC. And it was very difficult, be and because the same people said different things in these three bodies, uh, which is also <laughs> always an interesting uh, <laughs> situation when that happens, um, uh, it, it was at least clear to me and most members of the Reykjavik group were, who are uh, most of us were very new to our community, that we had to go to one single governance at our level. So at, at the strategic level, that we should go to one governance. It's so that we should join these, uh, these shareholders, NRMPC and, 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 and General Assembly functions into one. And in discussing this process, we found out that it would also be a good idea to bring the management teams together as one senior management team. If you look at Dante and Torina, you see that there are um, um, a very, um, uh, how do you call it? Um, uh, they're not overlapping, but complementary uh, to each other. And uh, the strengths of the one are the weakness of the other. So Torina is very good at the first stages of innovation. Uh, but when you go to the next phase and, and have to uh, deliver a real service, that, that is very difficult for a small organization. And Dante is very good in delivering services, but generating ideas is, is somewhat more difficult in a large organization that is service-oriented. So, so it's very complementary. And um, since then, we try to, uh, to find out a, a way of working, uh, uh, try to find a, an organizational structure and governance structure that that uh, brings these together and, and uh, with the best, the, of, both the worlds, best of both worlds, yes. And, and that's, of course, the difficult part of it. Bringing these together is not the difficult part, uh, but get the best out of it is, is, is the most difficult part. So we're working on that uh, uh, currently, and we, ha we will propose our next steps on, on Thursday, uh, and hopefully we will get into real action uh, starting in Paris next month, I think, uh, the, the, the Paris meetings where we lay the groundwork for the decision making and hopefully in the autumn um, uh, we will set up a new org, as we call it, and, and, and that's why uh, uh, this morning they said this might be the last conference called Torina Networking Conference. And I just propose to, to rename it to the New Orc Conference, but <laughs> <laughs> as it's just a uh, working title, this, that won't make it. Uh, <laughs> Soren, uh, what's your perspective on these developments? You know, uh, both Gent and Terena were things that were working very well from our perspective. <coughs> and they were doing complementary jobs. Predominantly, there was some small overlap, but almost nothing. And uh, they were good. The, as from our point of view, the cooperation was very good. The idea to have one organization for one thing is probably good. And I think that the idea to make uh, first, the first step was no, not totally integrating the whole thing, but making two organizations as a part of the new organization that is some sort of umbrella at the beginning, is a very good idea. Just not to disturb things that were working good. And 
we hope that it will be a good thing and maybe we will spend less money on meetings, you know? <laughs> that, that's, you, you don't have <laughs> to go time. to three meetings <laughs> yes. to say three different things. <laughs> yes, that, that's, that helps. Yes. Uh, Andreas, your perspective? Yes, uh, as a chair of this uh, acre group mentioned by Erwin, I, I fully support that. You didn't mention Dante, there's a third player, it's not the only <laughs> okay, collaboration. Okay, of course, when I mentioned Jean, I thought also about Dante. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I fully support that. I think we really need one uh, single umbrella organization, especially for strategy finding. We have now uh, actually a Dante strategy, we have a Terena strategy, and you are working on a new Chéan strategy. Uh, I think we have really to the find... One, the one to rule them all. <laughs> the one, to, uh, that, that's your view, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, really to come to one uh, single organization with different rules for services, for strategy finding, community building, and perhaps for, or per, for uh, different rules for project management, etc. I'm convinced that we will... Uh, take these uh, next hurdles uh, this week and next, next month in Paris and that really can come with a new merged organization, New Org. I really uh, hope that we can do that and can, we can really are convinced about the big, uh, the big ideas and do not hesitate uh, uh, to do that step because there are some minor issues here and there to be solved later. So Dave, as a, as a total outsider to this process, how are you looking at this? Uh, no, no longer divide and conquer in, in the future uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as, as, as I think most of you are aware, we had our own little adventure here <laughs> over the last few years that, that, that fortunately I think is behind us and we're really focused uh, together right now as a community in the U.S. with our state and regional networks, with our, with our ESNet uh, partner who... It, we, we, sh we share an enormous amount uh, with them as well. Uh, I, I, just two or three comments I would make. Number one, I don't want to get in the middle of European politics. Uh, uh, I can't imagine, uh, it would see, Terrain and Dante for us would be like having our network organization, you know, Rob Vitsky's network organization and Anna Hunsinger's uh, uh, community engagement organization completely separate. And kind of working, you know, in diff, you know, at, at, at a large distance from each other. I can't imagine how how hard that would be to try to synergize those those elements against a common set of agendas. Uh, it's hard enough, you know, having them in the same organization reporting to me and keeping the bandwidth of communication high enough. But what we've learned is when we do, uh, the value add we get. Uh, uh, you know, from, from, from having these very synergistic community engagement and, and, and network operating and building functions tightly coupled, you know, working strategies together, being, went back to my word, interdependent on each other, you know, uh, working out of the same budget base so they're able to make budget participate in budget priority decisions as a group as opposed to, you know, as, as a union as opposed to autonomously. Uh, in the U.S., we've just gained enormous value from that. Uh, we've also gained enormous value from being able to couple the, you know, our approach to Net Plus services and our federation into the same organizational construct where we're able to leverage these things. And what we're finding is that with that foundation that we've built, our community of universities are now actually beginning to ask us to do even more things, which you know is both good and bad, and in particular where um, uh, you know we went through this period in 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 um, information uh, what you would call ICT in the last two or three decades, where uh, the higher education community spawned at least 15 independent uh, 50 what we call a 501c3 not for profits organizations. Uh, that have all, all require the same board of directors to go to 15 meetings times two instead of two or three. It was creating an enormous amount of burden on the system and a real lack of strategic focus. We've now crossed over the line, I think, where the community is beginning to trust us to say, when we have something new we want to accomplish as a community, we don't have to go out and create another organization to do that. You know, we can have Internet 2 uh, step up to the operational and 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 you know business related responsibilities of that, and at the same time maintain 
leadership and control for that within the community. I think that's very important. My only other observation would be, and I, and I said this last year in the panel, uh, federation is hard. Uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a political, you know, as an academic political scientist, uh, when you're trying to figure out, you know, the way to approach collaboration. Um, federation is very, very difficult because you've got this, you know, when, 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 you're, when you're dealing on a federated model, you've always got this fundamental tension line of conflict of interest, right, where if X number of responsibilities go, you know, to, to, to the federated entity, you know, do these folks down here lose some? And, and I don't envy, you know, trying to address this issue. It's hard enough trying to ad address this, these issues in one country with 51 states uh, and a whole array of state uh, and regional network entities that are very important to our ecosystem, uh, trying to address the same set of issues across national boundaries, I know is even more difficult. And I think, uh, you know, the amount of progress that, that I hear you're making here is very reflective, I think, of a European community that, that you know, really understands um, uh, the enormous opportunities and challenges facing it are, 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 you know, trying to figure out how to get organized uh, to meet those challenges at the, at the European level, not just at the national level. You, you bring up an, an interesting point because federation has two sides uh, to it. On, on one side, you, uh, uh, we, you know, the European NRENs can federate and, and create an entity which has an operational strategic entity underneath it. On the other hand, if, if we talk about um, delivering uh, innovation, delivering services, you can do that in a federated way, which means, um, you know, that, like we discussed earlier with the CEO forum, some countries uh, deliver some services um, uh, to other countries within this federated approach. The other way of approaching it would be centralized. You, you know, you create a Dante, uh, let Dante just deliver all the services and on, NRANs do only the things inside their own borders and not outside. So um, what, 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 what should the model be? Federated or fully centralized? Or should we be somewhere in between? I think we can only create value if we uh, do things that the market isn't delivering. <laughs> which means that we need to use the full creative potential that we have in our community. And centralization has the, the, the drawback of being able to be very efficient, but not very creative. So if we want to use the creative potential in our community, we have to have a model that is also capable of, of being able to, to do federative or distributed, I would prefer that word, uh, distributed working and bring that to a centralized level to to be uh, to 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 roll it out to to the whole community, which is very important. So we have to be able to do both to to have this creative uh, 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 distribution and to bring roll that back to uh, to a central level. Uh, and if we can do both, that is very uh, that is very good. Soren. <coughs> You know, our NREN is specific, uh, and one way of keeping good people in the team was doing commercial business. And we are selling to banks network monitoring software, but we are not <laughs> delivering it to, to other NRENs in Europe. But we would give it for free, you know, of course, to other NRENs. Uh, I think that it should be good to uh, have products, I can say, uh, from different entrants, bring them to a central uh, commission or whatever, for Dante or for somebody else, some other one, and where there could be some sort of evaluation of the whole thing. And when such a body says that's a good product, then uh, all entrants can deploy it, because if we have services partially on the network, then it's a problem. It's good to have services throughout the whole network. And then you bring on one side innovation from each network, and on the other side, if it's good, then let's all take it. Andreas? I think it's it, on the European level, it's uh, quite similar than on the national level. 
if we work, uh, or we often or we have to work in developing our services very closely together with uh, our customers, the IT services within the uh, universities, and uh, I can't imagine doing all that work simply within Switch. So we, as you, as you said, we, we need all these decentralized uh, innovation, all these decentralized competencies, but when it becomes to operate a national network with a guaranteed service level, uh, with guaranteed uh, connections worldwide, I think that some central authority is needed. Um, you brought up some, uh, an, an interesting point which I'd like to explore further because I still don't see any hands in the room, so um, I, I continue <laughs> asking. Uh, uh, so um, the, the point I'd like to explore further is you say we, we also serve outside of the uh, research and education community. We, we have customers. Um, I hear that more and more, not always like moving towards the commercial side, although that might, might happen too, but certainly in st uh, um, NREN starting to serve uh, hospitals or starting to serve governments. Um, uh, I'd like to hear your, your view on that, on how, how will we deal with this if, if NRENs in different countries start to create different constituencies? Zoran? In our case, uh, we had almost a monopoly of the telecom operator until before four years approximately. But somehow, the National Research and Education Network had gigabit links throughout the country. And we used the opportunity that the government decided that we should support all education to connect all university hospitals or all hospitals that are doing something with education. And we really built uh, network of advanced hospitals on our <coughs> network. And not only that, we brought each of those hospitals with dark fiber to our network, you know. Mm -hmm. So we could have an enormous capacity and that uh, initiated in those hospitals building of electronic medical records and everything else, telemedicine and, you know, it was something that helped the community and that uh, improved the position of the network in the country. So that's a case where really they need high capacity, they need advanced services. And it's a community that is very important on the other hand in the country. Erwin? Uh, what we are currently doing is, is looking at, at neighboring areas. So, um, uh, schools, uh, uh, other schools, um, uh, hospitals, whether we can deliver service to them. Uh, and we, what we have always done is um, uh, delivering services temporarily for use cases that, that use, use more bandwidth or services than the, the normal market can, can deliver. Uh, what I think is very important for service is it, it has been shaped by a, a six-year-long discussion with our telecommunications authority about whether we can use, uh, deliver services outside a community. <laughs> or they said that we were a, 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 a network operator and we say, no, we, we are closed. Um, uh, we work, are working for a closed user group. So we are very much focused on who we can deliver to and not or not. And if we deliver services to, uh, to new groups, they should be, become part of, of our uh, group. So they should also become a member of a of, of surf organization. Um, but, uh, Andreas, maybe you want to say something about that too? Or? Uh, situation in Switzerland or Switch uh, divides uh, his customers into three circles. We have the inner circle, circle one. This, uh, we have there all the universities, and uh, we have a circle two that are institutions with close collaboration between uh, customers in circle one. For example, all the universities, the university hospitals are in the circle two and are served by Switch by many years. But we also have uh, research uh, departments of uh, 
public or private uh, companies mm -hmm. like the IBM uh, Research Center in Rüschikon on our network because they have close collaboration with different uh, universities in Switzerland. And that works with, uh, with no problem. There are no issues there. We charge different fees for the, for the same services because we want uh, this, uh, this um, uh, Circle 2 customers to contribute more to the community. And we also have uh, uh, customers in the Circle 3 that are really third-party customers and uh, with no uh, direct uh, link to the universities. We serve them in very special purposes, but only with services uh, developed for Circle 1. And that okay. works. But if, if I then look at the international level, uh, if, if, if you have a user group defined Circle 1, 2, 3, you have a different user group, you have a different user group. Um, if you start to build uh, an, an international infrastructure that you're using, Géant, um, that means that almost by definition that international infrastructure cannot have an acceptable usage policy because otherwise uh, you exclude several parts of entrance uh, or how, how are we going to deal uh, with that? Because if it wouldn't have an acceptable usage policy, maybe some countries wouldn't be allowed to support it because mm -hmm. it doesn't have an acceptable use. So I see, I see a sort of hard place and a rock. Anybody have a suggestion on how to solve <laughs> that? Am I, or am I wrong? Or You know, uh, most of our entries are at least partially funded by the government. And the government defines what we can do. So that part of the story of supporting hospitals is in the document where we were formed. I think that similar things happen in various countries, but uh, more or less that is all related to research and education. Mm -hmm. And of course that we need to make an acceptable use of policy because otherwise our networks will be crushed by telecom operators. So we need to have restrictions and Anything that is totally commercial must not appear on our network. And that, that must be the limit. And of course, each of those things for each country should be checked against the common rules. And probably the common rules, the common acceptable, acceptable user policy should be something that is not so strict. Mm. So that some country cannot be connected with its existing policy. Of course, if some country uh, has an NRA that is doing commercial job and totally competing with telecom operators, then it's a problem for them. How do you so, do that in, in the US? Well, uh, the, the, in the US, uh, uh, the Internet 2 infrastructure is a national infrastructure, and most of our last mile connectivity comes in through our state and regional connector networks. Uh, between those, you know, I into that entire fabric. Uh, the way we talk about the, this is a concept uh, in our national broadband plan we call community anchors. And, and this is education at all, all levels, including K-12, public libraries, uh, uh, health care providers, uh, uh, particularly the public health care providers and the university hospitals, public safety, um, uh, uh, public media, for instance. And across the whole US, there are approximately 200,000 distinct entities that fall into that category. The last survey we did, uh, we were just slightly under half of those, including about 65, 70% of the K, what we call the K-12, kindergarten to 12th grade schools. So our, the penetration of the RNA network into those communities is substantial in the US. It's occurred over time. There is a lot of differentiation at the state level as to what uh, their entities are able to get by with. There is the obvious political issue associated with uh, uh, being perceived as competitive with the incumbent telecom carriers or the local telecom carriers. The way we try to stay out ahead of that is to offer services that are not commercially viable services at scale at this point in time. And so, you know, our experience is when we stay one or two steps ahead, either in terms of bandwidth, advanced applications, uh, of where that incumbent 
carrier community is we stay in pretty good we stay in pretty good shape and so it's important for us as we engage these entities to be able to talk about the advanced work that is going there as opposed to the sort of standard commodity sort of sort of things that happen there um, in fact uh, while we receive no ongoing funding from the federal government in the US we are able to compete for federal grants and awards and uh, our recent network build uh, was in fact completed uh, with, uh, with a couple of large-scale major awards, one to Internet2, uh, that was fundamentally based on the premise that we would extend that network infrastructure to all of these community anchors and with a large award to ESNet. Uh, and we were able to, to, to figure out a way to make the system enable us to be able to build a common optical infrastructure that, uh, you know, was something that gave us enormous amounts of scale there. And, and so either, and, and then port, sort of pushing out into other spaces uh, between ESNet and Internet2, virtually all the federal agencies with any kind of research programs connect. We certainly would not be, um, while, while our AUP wouldn't preclude it, we would not be comfortable supporting uh, a large-scale administrative uh, uh, application base across a federal agency or a large company simply because it would require different network parameters than are consistent with what we need to put out there to be able to support the most advanced uh, state. And so our engineering bias is toward the most advanced state in the most reliable way possible. And, uh, and to engineer a network that, that you know, is gonna support a gazillion small transactions is not something that, that you know, is consistent with our mission. So yes, we provide an enormously broad array of support uh, to what we call these community anchor institutions in the US, but it varies a lot from straight to straight. Some state uh, research and education networks have actually been precluded by legislation from doing that. Others have been, uh, have been funded by state legislatures <laughs> to do that, and it all kind of depends on the political climate and what's going on in the state at that point in time. And, and whether they're effectively building their partnerships with the with the commercial provider community and, and not getting, you know, uh, large amounts of, of money spent in state legislatures lobbying to preclude them from doing a public mission. Okay. Okay. Andreas? Let me just add uh, one word to the needs of our Circle 2 customers. Uh, these customers have a good collaboration with, with Circle 1. Uh, for historical reasons, they always came about with the needs of network connectivity. But that has changed. In the last two years, we see that they come about uh, AI. They want to join our AI federation. Mm -hmm. They're not anymore interested sure. in, uh, yeah. uh, not yeah. interested, yeah. but the unique yeah. selling yeah. proposition yeah. is AI, not, anymore, net, net, not network. And so that gives a good idea of the change of the needs and where we as NRANs may create value for such customers. Getting back to, ah, uh, we have a question in the room. Uh, we have two questions three, in the room. Three. Okay, they're, three. Three. they're ready to ask questions. Well, I don't see the third one. What, uh, is there another? I see class, I see Niels. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Toby Rodwell from Dante. I was just wondering uh, what, what the panel thought about the split uh, for NRENs between uh, providing networks for researchers to research on and providing networks for R&E, as it were. So networks to do researching, research networking, and, um, uh, and just production quality networks for research and education to use. Well, it's a good question. Uh, Aaron, you want to tackle that? Um, yes, I, I, I think what makes NRENs different from both commercial parties, you know, telecom operators, and from um, uh, research laboratories is that we, we have some place in the middle and that we try to uh, create uh, networks that are capable of production, cap uh, production um, uh, uh, traffic. Um, in practice, you see that, that most of us have several networks running at the same time. So you have a test network um, uh, trying out new things and, and at, a surf net that, that is called networks for research, and you, uh, or research on networks. Sorry, I, I switched the labels. <laughs> uh, research on networks, and and the, and the second one is 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 the networks for research and education. That is production 
uh, uh, ready and, and delivering services to, to both researchers that need very big data streams, but also for the, the normal email uh, and, and web browsing. So, so I think we need to do both and, um, uh, and that we are always in a good position if uh, our customers are requesting more and more uh, uh, functionality and capacity. If, if there's a drive from our user community to have more, then, then we are in good place because we can find the people who need these services and are, are willing to, to participate in, in creating these services and testing these. Uh, so that is an, a very important part. And that's the, well, the spot in, in, in the landscape between research on networking and, and commercial telecom operators that, that we fill. And if there isn't that need anymore, uh, from both sides, uh, then we ha really have to think on where, do, where we deliver the value. And that might be in AI, as, as, as Andreas explains in the future, uh, or somewhere else. But we need to do this check for ourselves where, do we, where we deliver self, uh, value to our community. Yeah. That, that used to actually be a hard question technically, but mm -hmm. but, but post DWDM, it's a, it, you know it becomes a heck of a lot easier here. I mean I mean you know well, you know on managed you know on a managed ten gig ten gig service you got to you know you, it really limits what you can do. I mean we've got eighty eight you know we, on our optical infrastructure we can roll up eighty eight hundred gig waves. Uh, nationally, if someone's willing to write the checks to buy the interface cards to do that, and so our perspective on that for the last year and a half has been, bring it on, you know, bring it on. The more the more you bring, the more of these research stuff you, things you bring, the better. But we are also going to run and have to run very high availability layer three and layer two services to support both general purpose users as well as uh, you know specific science and education projects uh, but but uh, you know that's a lot easier question to build your strategy around than it was prior to the, to when we were able to acquire dark fiber based optical infrastructures that we you know that we're able to own lock stock and barrel Niels. Um, we have seen a stream of revelations from the Snowden uh, case. <laughs> um, should European or even global NRANs define a strategy to actually, well, let's call it combat some of the negative effects that uh, even our users and our institutions will be facing, uh, both on the network level as well as on the services level? Um, well. Who wants to tackle this? <laughs> I, I definitely want, but I'm the chair. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think the answer to that is, is unambiguously yes. Uh, I mean, I, 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 as I've watched this whole set of things unfold, you know, I find myself waking up in the middle of the night a lot of times thinking that the, um, you know, that, that, that the politics uh, and the realities surrounding what's happening in the privacy space and what's happening in the, you know, in the cyber espionage space uh, is going to, has the potential to create a major nightmare for us. Uh, if we're confronted, you know, there are already a number of, you know, you certainly look within the U.S. government, there are a number of, of people who, who fall into the to, to what I would call the intense cybersecurity category, who who kind of look at what we're doing and say, you've got connections into China, you've got connections into uh, Syria, you've got you and 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 uh, you know I worry a lot that um, we can make bad choices, and we're confronted with those choices on almost a daily basis, that could result in outcomes, any one of which could could cascade into uh, having some, some very hard lines drawn of what, around what we do, both on the national level and the global level. We, we, you know, I, I said we had spawned uh, four new, uh, we're in the process of spawning four new working groups that we'd like to go after this, one of which is, is global security. And we've got a kind of an initial set of thoughts from some of our own folks that we'd like to start expanding out. I, I do know uh, in the basis of the conversations we've been having, and you, you all may be having the same conversations, that Virtually every one of the 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 the, the inrins in the forum have added uh, an executive, you know, a senior executive level position for for security and or privacy within the last 
uh, 12 to 18 months. And I think that uh, just as we've done at the campus level, uh, we're going to have to stop, take a deep breath and send off a substantial amount of our resources into trying to deal with this and trying to understand where it is we can make deadly mistakes, you know, by uh, things that we think are innocent, like exposing uh, 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 bilateral traffic between two actors, you know, meant to kind of you know, in the, in the old days to us, that looked like a great way of demonstrating the value of RE networks. Well, in the days ahead, it could be seen as a violation of privacy because we don't have any right from, you know, our members to be able to expose that data to anyone else. And so there are a lot of security and policy and privacy issues here that are going to need to be parsed. And we need better strategies. Andreas? Just let uh, <coughs> me add something. I think Snowden has done a good job for us, the Sandrins. <laughs> If yeah. I talk to my customers, uh, data location in Europe is um, <laughs> hardly accepted. You don't speak about it. <laughs> hardly accepted. Yeah. Uh, data location in Switzerland is okay, it's good. But even better is data location within the community. Mm -hmm. That's a chance for us. What yeah. Yeah. We can take it. Okay, uh, I see that uh, two members of one family are trying to ask a question here. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not going to make that choice. I, I'm not going to make a choice. <laughs> I, I had my hand up way earlier. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe Lara had her hand up way earlier. Don't, don't mention that topic, that's very sensitive. <laughs> Uh, Klaas Wierga, Cisco. Um, I, um, listening to you guys, um, being um, very uh, self-congratulatory and, and, and uh, rightfully so uh, about the increased collaboration, um, I wonder if, if you are also uh, looking at the, the other side of that, that coin, the... Um, the, the formation of like an ITU of NRENS uh, that uh, do group thinking and, and if you're not um, careful will run as lemmings all together into the abyss. Uh, Erwin mentioned this, uh, this uh, co collective creativity. Um, at the same time, I've seen in a lot of these things, and both in, in my current company, uh, but also when I was active in the Jeanne project, I saw also a lot of group force towards suboptimal solutions. So how are you going to organize dissent? How are you going to make sure that um, this one clever ID that goes against the stream will still surface? It's a good question. And if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, but I, I think uh, what I tried to, to get across earlier is that you have, these, have, to have the ability to create this creative potential we have in our community and work towards it and, and, both, and be able to, to scale it up. I think an interesting um, endeavor we had as, as this, uh, within the CEO forum is, is looking at the cloud and looking at the way we, um, we could handle the, these outside private companies in delivering the services we need for a price uh, that, that is good for us. And well, we, it, it was an interesting endeavor because we ran into many, many problems. Uh, problems from le legislation in the different continents towards uh, um, uh, the, the different position the, the, the organizations have within their community. And what I liked about what happened, uh, the outcome wasn't great until now, but what I liked is that the, the discussions were real and uh, that we were able to tell each other the truth about what was happening and what, what we needed as, as an Enron, and as Andreas and also Dave has, has, has said earlier, is we work for our own community, and, and that is national and not, and not an international community. Um, uh, there are only a few international customers like CERN, 
um, uh, but the, mo the majority is, is national, and we have to really think about how this fits, what we do as, as international, within international collaboration, how that fits into a national uh, solution. The interesting thing is, is that um, um, ideas happen at, uh, 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 are implemented at, at different locations at the same time. Uh, for instance, when we started uh, implementing our uh, own cloud infrastructure in the Netherlands together with our sister organization, so Sarah, um, we learned that Switch um, uh, was also doing the same thing and, and it has already um, uh, implemented uh, uh, own cloud, uh, personal cloud storage, uh, that is. Uh, uh, I think it's called Switch Drive. It is, yeah. And uh, our <laughs> service is called Surf Drive, so that's very interesting. And we, we have learned a lot from each other, I think, in the process, because we knew each other and we could phone each other on what was happening and, and, and where you run into if you try to set up these services. Yeah, yeah I, I'd say one more thing. Okay. No. When, when, whenever you make choices, you make mistakes. When you don't make choices, you make catastrophes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, one, one, what, what the spirit we're trying to capture here, you know, it, you know when, when we talked about that mantra of co small coalitions, the willing and able, who, who are able to get things, you know, from point A to point B, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is, is that my philosophy is, you know, uh, you can spend an enormous amount of time trying to organize the universe to do something. And by the time you, you get it done, you've invested 10 years worth of effort and you find out it's the wrong thing, or the world has passed you by. I mean, I think what we're trying to impart here is you know, kind of a philosophy of stay light, stay agile, stay fast. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, our, our, our friends from Silicon Valley in the US have this concept they call the 3F concept, you know, fail, forward, fast. Uh, you know, if you're gonna try to get something done, you know, try to get to useful instantiations as quickly as you can because you're going to learn whether you were right or wrong and you can adjust yourself. If you try to boil the world and do, you know, and, and, and do it completely and perfectly with a consensus on everybody's part, by the time you're done, uh, it's, either, it's either irrelevant or the window's closed. And, and, and I recognize well, there's that, risk in what we're trying to do here. Th that comes again back to what Aaron said earlier, that we need to get rid of the not invented here syndrome. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a very important okay. element of, of, of this. Yeah. Andreas, you I, were... You I wanted just to wanted to add, uh, uh, to avoid these uh, this, uh, things you mentioned, it's very important to listen to the customers. We are only serving universities. We are only serving education and research. But our customers, they do education and research. And if there is the one idea to find, I'm sure that somebody within our community already had this idea. Yeah. So we have to work closely with our customers and then bring things to an international collaboration in the uh, European and one field. Yeah. Last question, Licia. <laughs> Lisa Florio Terena, still Terena. Um, I have a um, very simple question, actually. You say, at least my impression is that you would like to be global and that your mission is really to share experiences also with other NRNs. But uh, it, it's not clear to me how you plan to engage with those NRNs that are not participating in the forum, how you bring in the subject experts. For instance, I was making a joke about, uh, we talk about the network architecture, but the architects meet elsewhere. So, which is okay, because there are different levels of discussion, but how do you ensure that there is a link between what the hands do and what the head thinks? My b ambition is national and not global, because that is what I'm working for. Um, if you look at what we try to do nationally, you, you have to be able to scale up internationally because our community is very open and, and, and globally active. Um, so we work on a European level and on a global level. If you look at the global level, at, and, and you refer to the CEO forum, which I participate in, but it's not my ambition. My ambition is, is, is that I bring to the table is national. The ambition of the forum is to be able to 
deliver the services as, as national members to deliver the services uh, globally. And what we see is that if you if you look at Glyph, which is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Servnet is, is part of Glyph and an important sponsor I've always been from from Glyph. Um, we in Glyph are really able to, to define the new ideas, collaborate with, with the, the new applicants, so that the applications are, are, are also there. But how do we get from this idea and demonstration and standardization and interoperability stage towards a real working global, global um, infrastructure? And there we need a sort of, uh, of behavior of, of all these end runs in a certain direction. And how do you well, try, try to, to move this forward. And there you need not only the, the people who are involved in the technical uh, uh, part, but also in the business part. And, and what I think the, the CEO Forum is, is trying to achieve is not only f accelerate the, the technical part, which is everywhere in our community that, that we try to do this, but also accelerate the business part. And, and we don't have real structures for that on a global scale currently. And uh, I don't know whether the CEO forum will exist in five years' time, if it will be some completely different, but it's an, uh, it's an initiative to try to, to drive this forward and not getting stuck into technical discussions, but also moving forward in business-wise um, uh, decisions on global solutions. And Chris is... <laughs> Completely disagreeing with me, or? <laughs> I was just going to make a comment. Um, the, the first question, uh, Chris Hancock from Arnett, and I'm on the Global CEO Forum, uh, but the first question that was raised, I think, by Andreas, was about the same thing that you've raised about communication. And um, just a couple of comments. And Andreas made a really good point that's come through. We're all primarily concerned about our customers, right, and what we're trying to drive. And we would not have got engaged with uh, Shell's Net Plus services or with the Global Real-Time Comms Exchange if we weren't... Our customers were begging for that, right? They were pushing us. So that's, that's, that's the, been our focus. Um, but it's also... Um, Dave uses the word interdependence and, uh, and uh, Erwin uses uh, acceleration of these things. And I, and I would talk about getting greater alignment. So in the next two days, for example, we're meeting with the Global Real-Time Comms Group and the Global Video Alliance group existed. Right? We found a lot of groups across the world that were some, some meeting, some very serious about it, and it's getting some alignment around that, not trying to you know, um, clean them up or anything. It was really trying to say, and those two groups are coming together. right? Um, but the final one I'm getting from your question and the first question today is, I'm, I'm, I think it's a learning for probably the three of us and, and others in the room uh, that we've got to communicate our message a bit better. Uh, we probably think we're doing that okay. There's several ways other than us putting out a, uh, a thing. One is give us a resource, put some, as Dave said earlier, it's about putting some um, uh, rubber on the road here. So we're, and we're after resource and we're, st we're all stretched, but we're all putting in resource. Some of us are putting in money. Um, participate in one of the subgroups. And we said that at Internet too, you know, get, get engaged and do that. Um, we've talked about a briefing summit, you know, that might be, for all NRENs at some point, but that's something down the track. Um, and, you know, use the global PR network that I think they met on Sunday, but there's a lot of PR representatives as well. So I'm listening to that thinking that we could do better in some of the, the messaging because we think it's getting out there, but some of it is not. And I think, uh, there, but I think there are ways to do that. And we would welcome, I know on the group I chair, I would welcome other uh, participants who, who have a knowledge in. Uh, uh, you know, the Global Real-Time Comms Exchange uh, work. And well, the, I certainly yeah. hope that with this session we uh, contributed a little bit uh, in, uh, in uh, expanding the knowledge about that. And uh, that brings me to the end of this session. Uh, I, I hope uh, you in the audience have gotten a little bit of insight about the thinking that's going on on the international level and the European level on how we should cooperate. I also hope that you saw that there's still a lot of problems to be resolved. This is not an easy thing. Uh, we need to keep working on that. We need to keep talking to one another. And I certainly hope that we keep doing that and, of course, uh, keep meeting in venues like this to, to better understand each other because I think the only way forward is based on trust and not on distrust. Um, thank you very much, uh, our panel members, uh, Zoran, Erwin, Dave, 
Andreas, uh, for being here and sharing your thoughts. A big hand of applause for our panel members, please. Before you leave, there's a couple of things I need to say. Um, uh, I hope I, I remember by the top of my head, but uh, there's uh, uh, the uh, opening reception in an hour in the O'Reilly Hall, across the back across the, the, the square. Uh, you need to have this, otherwise you're not allowed to enter. So uh, uh, if you're going to jump, jump, uh, uh, dump your bag somewhere, uh, don't forget to keep your... Uh, 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 label with you so that you uh, can be identified as an honest participant. Um, uh, uh, what else did I need to, to say? Oh, you need to go online and give your uh, opinion about this session. Uh, please say it was brilliant so I can get to do another one next year. <laughs> and uh, uh, was there any, anything else, class, that I needed to say? Oh, you need to put the ye yellow stickers on one of the student uh, posters and, and then hope that not a clever student gets up really early tomorrow morning to remove them and put them on. A <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>